So, good morning or good afternoon for some of you. Welcome again to this first uh, session of the Hipparchos Colloquia. Uh, before I go to this colloquium as usual, uh, let me remind you that every month we will try to have one of these. And I'm, I'm saying try because uh, the next colloquia of this year are still cooking, so I cannot tell you which will be the next, but uh, there will be a next for sure. So uh, our speaker today is George Maloko from the University of Nottingham. Um, first time I met Jorma was like a ages ago, like 1991 or something, I guess, at MIT. And, uh, well, we've met quite a few times afterwards, but uh, that looks like a prehistory to me. So I was still doing my PhD thesis, so really it was prehistory. So uh, <clears throat> Jorma did his PhD thesis in Helsinki, Cambridge, and Copenhagen in a superposition, probably, of these places. According to what I understood, it was, it's kind of a pretty good description, right? <laughs> and then he went uh, for uh, quite a long time to North America, so he was as a, post, as a postdoc in Edmonton in Canada, also uh, in Milwaukee, not particular order because I cannot remember, also Maryland, also Syracuse, and uh, then he went again to, back to Europe to the Albert Einstein Institute, and after all these few years going around the world, he established in Nottingham where he is now. And uh, since then he's been doing work, apart from quantum cosmology probably in the early days, then he turned into quantum field theory in curved space times, which is uh, the kind of topics that he's going to talk about. And in more recent years, it's not only in space time, but also trying to mimic this sort of uh, quantum field theory in curved space-time phenomena in the lab, right? So uh, the best thing that uh, I can do is that let you talk. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is the microphone on? Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thank you for the invitation to uh, visit Madrid and uh, talk today. It's been very pleasant in Madrid for the past few days. It's certainly different from the weather in Nottingham at the moment. Uh, I'm much enjoying both the science and the environment of the visit. So uh, the topic is uh, black holes from the... Uh, sky to the laboratory. Um, I'll put up a, a plan of the talk in a moment, but I'd like to start, before we go up to the sky, I'd like to start uh, with a very down-to-earth uh, question. Okay, so here are photos of uh, three scientists. You can see uh, they are not pictures taken yesterday, uh, they're 100-something years old, and that in part uh, explains the lack of diversity in this roster. If, if we give a talk like this, a colloquium like this, 100 years from now, and we start with a similar roster, it, it will look quite different. But this is what we are stuck with for today. So here are three scientists, and I'd like to start from a very down-to-earth application, namely satellite navigation, global positioning system, the Google Maps or, or, or similar. So of these three scientists, two of them did something that is essential for uh, the global positioning system to work. So I would ask you to pick the odd one out. And I should say that I've usually asked this question to pre-university um, uh, persons, persons who are in their last years in school, and there you get people who know something about this roster, but other parts not, at, not so well. Now, you are a much more mature audience, so I'm expecting you to do much better. So, ladies and gentlemen, if, if we start from the left, from physical appearance or from other clues in the picture, can you tell who this person is? 
I should say I'm inviting uh, suggestions from undergraduates in the first instance, please. Okay, anyone brave enough to suggest who this person on the left is? Yes? Excellent. It is James Clark Maxwell, right? And uh, the thing he's most famous for is, of course, Maxwell's equations, electromagnetism, predicted radio waves. Okay, could have something to do with Satnav. Uh, the person in the middle, uh, the, the physical appearance, I might not be so, so familiar with that, but there's a big hint in this picture. Who's, who do you think this one is? Yes. Say again. Okay. So, <laughs> right. so, so the physical appearance it may not be that distinctive, but there's a big hint in this picture. We are talking about X-rays. It was Röntgen who, uh, uh, who, who discovered them. Uh, I should say that I am biased. I mean, I grew up in Finland, and there when you take an X go to have your X-ray uh, taken, you don't say X-ray you say you get your Röntgen picture taken, so you, you really know the name from the, from the very start. But, uh, okay, yeah, so X-rays, okay. and the person on the right, okay, and, and, uh, I'm not even asking suggestions. I mean, one of the most recognizable faces in science and beyond. Uh, and uh, for today, uh, we are interested in his uh, most famous uh, piece of work, relativity, uh, general and special relativity uh, theory of gravitation. So the question is, which of these three scientists is not essential for satellite navigation? Two of them are essential. Who's the odd one out? Okay, and here the school, uh, uh, people who are in their last year in school, there you get very diverse answers. What do you think? Yes? Why? Indeed. Relativity, uh, so uh, the <coughs> uh, Setnav operates on radio waves, certainly, and then what is known to specialist audiences like today is that relativity plays a crucial part. So it is these two persons who play a crucial part in, uh, the, uh, in satellite navigation. Uh, so I'd like to start from there. I'd like to recall why in satellite navigation Einstein is needed, Einstein is not important just describing things in, in black holes out there in the sky and cosmology. Einstein is part of everyday technology here on Earth. And from that starting point, we'll go up to the, uh, uh, to the sky. I'll show some pictorial evidence of why, there are, of why we are quite convinced there are black holes out there in the sky. Okay. Um, and then uh, towards the laboratory simulation, I'm asking why would you want to simulate black holes in the laboratory? And for that, I will need a short theory interlude. Uh, and that has to do with how you extract energy from black holes, both at the classical level and at the quantum level. And that gives the motivation then to think what has been done in laboratory simulating black holes, what is in the process of being done. Okay, and that is uh, ongoing research here and now. Um, so that's my plan anyway. If some questions, comments come to your mind, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and try to catch my attention. If you catch my attention, I will do my very best to, uh, to try and answer. Any questions, thoughts at this point? Okay, so let's spend two overheads recalling where the, these uh, Einstein corrections in uh, global position uh, in the global positioning system come from. I've got here a cartoon of how the global positioning system works. 
Uh, okay, so uh, I, I confess I made it myself from scratch, so the quality of the artwork, it does not live up to the... Uh, um, uh, what was the museum where I was this morning? Sor Soroya Museum. I spent a nice uh, hour and a half this morning at the Soroya Museum, and it really puts me in shape. But okay, so the, here's a cartoon of how the global positioning system works. So there are these satellites orbiting the Earth on precisely known orbits. Each of them has an atomic clock, a, a very precise clock, and a radio sender that sends the time signal of that clock. Okay? And then that time signal from that clock, it comes with radio waves. There's this person here on Earth. If you look very carefully, you might see the cell phone on, in the hand, okay? So there is this, a, a receiver of those signals. And if at the same time there are four satellites there uh, above the horizon, you get four signals. They all come with slightly different time delays. Uh, so from those different time delays of those different uh, signals, the software in your uh, smartphone, they can compute where you are, latitude, longitude, and elevation, and the uh, time where you are. So four satellites, four data points, you can measure those four numbers. SatNav tells you where you are. And of course, this does not look particularly impressive, does it? It's almost like school level uh, mechanics and geometry. Okay, trigonometry, it needs to be three-dimensional trigonometry, so might not be standard what you do in school, but I mean, it's, it's something that the ancient Greeks would have had no problem with. They would have understood perfectly well what's happening here. But this is only part of the story. This does not uh, let the global positioning system work. To make it work, you need Einstein. And there the issue is what is happening at these satellites. The satellites are up there, they are moving. Einstein tells us that the time up there in the clocks, it's not quite the same thing as the time down here on Earth. There's nothing wrong with the clocks up there. They are precise atomic clocks. But Einstein tells us that this very notion of the time up there in those satellites, in their trajectories. It's not the same thing as the time here down on Earth. Um, how you do the calculation? Well, so here you use Einstein, and in particular you use the general theory of relativity. You need to use Einstein's theory of gravity to, uh, gravity to do it. It's a full general relativistic calculation. Uh, but as the gravitational field is weak, you can uh, if you like, you can split the effect into two parts, attribute it to two uh, uh, effects within general relativity. One is the orbital velocity of the satellites, and if you really push the uh, terminology, you can think of it as a special relativistic effect. It's a motion effect. Okay? And there, this velocity effect says that compared with the clocks down here, the satellite clocks they run slow, and you can put a number to it, it's a few microseconds per day. Okay. Then there's the second effect, the gen genuinely general relativistic effect, the height. We are in the gravitational well of the Earth, and we down here on Earth are much deeper in the well than the satellites up there. And because of this uh, gravitational time delay effect, uh, or, or, or time uh, dilatation effect, the satellite clock, compared with our clocks, they run faster, and you can put a number to it, that's, that's some tens of microseconds per day. You'll notice that the effects run in opposite directions, and it is this general relativistic effect that is the bigger one. You put those two together with the right signs, and the overall effect that compared with our clocks, the satellite clocks, they run faster by 38 microseconds per day. So if you didn't know about that, should you be worried? I mean, 38 microseconds, it doesn't sound much. 
But remember, we want the location here on Earth, and when we convert those time delays into location, that conversion happens with the speed of light. And in one microsecond, light travels 300 meters. Uh, okay, a quick calculation says that if you didn't know about general relativity, these corrections, then 10 meter accuracy, which you certainly want uh, for SATNAV, you'd be losing that accuracy in about two minutes. One might argue that talking about corrections is sort of misleading even. They are, these uh, time delays, these time uh, dilatations, they are an essential part of making global positioning system work. With, if we didn't know about Einstein, the system just would not work at all. If you put it in graphic terms, Einstein's theory is part of everyday technology. Einstein's theory of gravitation saves lives. And if that is the only message you take home from today, I will be very happy. <laughs> Thoughts about this? Okay, so Einstein is important with current technology, even here on Earth, in everyday uh, settings. Let's go up to the sky. So, uh, black holes, a dramatic prediction of Einstein's theory, of course. Okay. And uh, there was a long and tortuous history from the uh, 1915, 1916, when, when sort of first hints, theoretical hints of black holes came about and were not understood. Then it took decades to appreciate that this might actually have some role in astrophysics and that they might actually exist in, in the sky. How many of you have seen this Oppenheimer movie that has come, uh, come out? Okay, very good. There's one place in the Oppenheimer movie where they refer to Oppenheimer's work on gravitational collapse in black holes, 1939. So Oppenheimer was known as a gravitational collapse person in those days. Right? People didn't talk about black holes yet in the 1930s, but they knew that something funny is happening to the stars. And Oppenheimer contributed to this evidence that there's something happening at the strange happening at the end of stars. And then in the 60s, there started to be good evidence that yes, the Einstein's theory really predicts that stars collapse, they form black holes. There were mathematical results that those black holes that form, they should be remarkably simple objects. They don't have hills and valleys and, and uh, so on. They are descri described by just a couple of parameters. Or oh, that's what Einstein's theory says anyway. Okay. And in the 60s, um, okay, so I, uh, I started university in 1979. And at that time, there was already evidence that black holes probably are out there, but it was still, uh, it was not yet quite sort of um, convincing evidence. There was a serious debate, might there be something else? There was Cygnus X1 radio sources and so on. Well, now it's 2024. I mean, black holes really are there. So, uh, Okay, lots of observational evidence. I'll just show a couple of pictures of the best showcase scenarios. So one way how we know about black holes is centers of galaxies. So there's, um, uh, there's a Hubble, um, Hubble Space Telescope picture of M87. And there is a black hole at the center of it. You don't see the black hole itself, but when there's matter that goes down, some of that matter gets ejected uh, so, because of the um, angular momentum, the rotation of the black hole, and we see the uh, beam of, of particles that comes out. So we think that most, uh, possibly even all, galaxies uh, have a black hole at their center. And we have evidence uh, of, of this sort about them. After 2015, a new body of evidence started coming in gravitational wave detection gravitational waves 
created by collisions merging of black holes. Um, there the masses are some tens of solar masses, here they are 10 to 6, 10 to 9 solar masses. So uh, there are black holes out there, evidence is quite good. This is not an embarrassing question anymore. Our own galaxy is uh, not an exception. I mean, cosmologically speaking, we live in a perfectly respectable neighborhood, and there is a black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Here's an infrared picture of stars near our own galactic center. Uh, there's a black hole about there, and you can't, of course, see it. In this picture, you see these individual stars that are around the black hole. It's difficult to see those stars. It's the galactic center, so it's fairly close to us, cosmologically speaking, but it's in the galactic plane. And when we look at the galactic center, there's lots of dust and so on. You can't see their invisible light. This is not a picture taken in visible light. This is a picture taken in infrared. The infrared can get through the uh, cosmic dust. So, that, so this is done by infrared astronomy. And so this observation of the galactic center in infrared, it's been developed over the past approximately 30 years at the uh, extraterrestrial physics Max Planck uh, Institute in Germany. And here's a snapshot. Uh, okay, now uh, if you go to the website, you see about 20 years of observations of how these stars go around the black hole, uh, how, how these stars go around the black hole. You can follow the orbits of the individual stars. I did not have the presentation technology to show the movie over here, but what I can show is a cartoon of what we see about the orbits. There's a selection of those uh, orbits. Some of, uh, over the past 20 years, uh, a few of these stars have done a full circle around their orbits, some only part of their orbits, but we see those motions of those individual stars. And that tells us there is an object there, it's uh, a few uh, t times 10 to 6 solar masses, and from those closest by orbits, we know that the size of this object, it cannot be much bigger than our solar system. Okay. Uh, so if you think uh, how large that black hole actually is, it's approximately the, um, the size of the orbit of Mercury, okay. but this closest uh, passing by stars, it's about three times the, the size of our solar system. So that much mass in such a small space, there's no other object we know of than a black hole. Uh, that, that can be there. So this is really quite good evidence. And this evidence has been in, in development over the past 20, 30 years. Over the past few years, through the Event Horizon Telescope, we have even better evidence. So uh, event, event Horizon Telescope, so it operates in, on radio waves, it's radio astronomy. So, so, so it's a global enterprise, so, uh, telescopes all over, over the globe, and they collaborate to do these pictures. And a few years ago, they shot a picture of, of uh, the um, M87 galaxy, the one that I showed earlier on, and there there's this 10 to 9 uh, solar masses uh, object. So this is radio waves. It's not true colors, right? It's not visible uh, spectrum, but it is uh, radio waves, and this illustrates the distribution of, of, this, um, uh, of those radio waves. And there's the black hole, and there's how uh, those radio waves are going around the black hole, how the black hole bends the space-time around it, and you see this halo around the black hole. So that was a few years ago, or, well, five, six years ago. Uh, then Milky Way, so as the black hole there, it is much closer, but it is in the galactic plane, so it's hard to see even in radio waves, so there was more uh, work required to reconstruct this picture, but in 22 the picture is there, and it is evidence there is black hole there at the center, and there is this uh, halo of, uh, that we've observed in radio astronomy. So the evidence really is good. Black holes are out there in the sky. 
They are part of everyday structures in astrophysics. They are large. Okay. So uh, <coughs> there's a 10 to 9 solar masses, 10 to 6 solar masses. These black holes that we've uh, observed with gravitational waves, they are some tens of solar masses. Large objects, very classical objects, okay? Um, what about quantum aspects of black holes? So these astrophysical objects out there in the sky, they are quite classical and we would not expect quantum physics to have a large role in their description, at least in, in the present stage of their evolution. But there are good reasons to think uh, that quantum properties of black holes, they have something to do with the fundamental structure of black holes. And I'd now like to turn in that direction here. I'll turn slowly. I'll start still thinking about macroscopic objects and I'll start thinking why, where, do, where do the first ideas come that quantum might have a role there? And the first hint that quantum might have a role comes from uh, thinking about energy balance. Still thinking about large black holes, stellar mass or, or higher, okay? And uh, you want to ask what happens to energy? What kind of uh, energy exchange can you do with black holes? And you might be uh, thinking that it, it's black, so something goes there and then it can't come back, so that, what are you talking about, energy exchange? Something just goes down. And, so. but, uh, but in the 60s, it was realized that it's not quite that simple. So the key word here is uh, something we call Penrose process. And uh, this is, of course, Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose, who got his share of, of the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And, uh, well, the Nobel Prize did not come from this particular paper, but it came from related work done at, at, related, uh, at, at, at the same time. So this is part of the, in, in the bigger scheme of things, this is part of the story uh, that contributed to Roger Penrose's part of the, uh, of the Nobel Prize. So we are talking about late 60s over here. So uh, let me outline what this process does. It's a question about energy exchange. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, earlier I asked a question and I invited undergraduates to come first. How about more senior persons in the audience? This picture here I've taken from a very well-known textbook. How many of you know what the textbook is where this picture comes from? Any takers and any guesses? It's a very well-known textbook. Yeah. It's not Jackson. It is a textbook on Einstein's theory. So uh, I should say that uh, in the visitor office in which I am here on, on, the, on the second floor, there are a number of desks, and there's one desk there with some books in there. And there's a copy of this book open there on that desk. It's not open on that particular page, but that, there's a copy of that book there. Any takers? Yes? Hawking, well, so Hawking and Ellis, they have a textbook from the very same year, okay, 50 years ago. But this is the other one that came out that year. Yes? Wheeler, Misnathorn Wheeler, gravitation. Okay, so uh, uh, I understand that nowadays people read things online, but in days when we did textbooks. This was the standard textbook, and this is, the, uh, this is where I, I took the copy, uh, I took the picture, so it's from this Misnathorn Wheeler te uh, textbook, Gravitation, 50 years, and still in print, okay? 
So, uh, what is this energy uh, extraction, uh, energy uh, exchange thing? So we've got a black hole there. Let's say it's a stellar mass black hole formed in gravitational collapse. And let's make it a rotating black hole. Uh, we think that astrophysical black holes do rotate. I mean, stars rotate. When you have a star that collapses and creates a black hole, you get a rotating black hole, and that's allowed by Einstein's theory. So, so there's a rotating black hole. So the black hole rotates that way. And when it rotates, well, there's the event horizon, the place from which you can't get back. But uh, as the black hole rotates, it sort of drags the space-time near the event horizon along. So there's, in a certain sense, there's rotation happening in the space-time over there. And now the energy exchange process is the following. There's an advanced, civiliz uh, advanced civilization who have built a structure over here around the black hole. And from there, they are sending down a space shuttle that has a cargo bay. And in that cargo bay, you put your payload. You can think of it as the waste that you'd like to get rid of. Maybe some uh, nuclear waste or something, something that you'd very much like to get rid of. You load your shuttle, you drop your shuttle there towards the black hole on a carefully calculated orbit. You let the shuttle fall in this region near the black hole, okay, there. And at that point there, you open the cargo bay doors, you do a modest explosion, and you eject this waste, this payload, and let the payload fall in the black hole. You do it so that you try to do it against the black hole rotation. Okay, the payload goes down. You get a kick on your spaceship, so your spaceship comes uh, up faster than it used to, nicely uh, shown in this cartoon. It comes out quite fast. And over there, you've got equipment with which you capture the uh, energy in the motion of the spaceship. So you drop the spaceship there, say, without initial velocity. It comes back with significant velocity over there. You capture the energy over there with some, uh, some device. So what's happened is you sent in some mass. You got back less mass, but also some kinetic energy. Okay? You've converted the energy in your payload into, uh, into uh, say, electricity or other energy that you can collect here. So there's some energy exchange that's going on. And uh, so, so far, nothing particularly problematic. You've got lost, uh, you've got rid of some mass, you've gained some energy, okay? Einstein says E equals mc squared, that's, that, that's uh, okay. But when you do the calculation, uh, you can arrange this ejection happen so that the extracted energy that you get over there, it's more than mc squared. So Einstein says that E equals mc squared, you could expect to convert the mass of your uh, waste into energy, but here something more happens. You get back more energy than you expected by E equals mc squared. You've managed to gain energy somehow. And the energy needs to come from some place. Where it comes from is the rotational motion of this black hole. So the spin of the black hole goes down. The mass of the black hole goes down. Uh, so you, you can do a technical split between different types of contributions to the black hole's mass over there. But the bottom line is the mass of the black hole goes down in this process, and you gain energy. You extract energy from the black hole, you make the mass of the black hole go down. It's still a black hole. You can't get the waste back from behind the event horizon, but you've managed to extract energy. They are not so passive objects. Classical scenarios, certainly, but they are not passive objects. You can do energy extraction. 
You can put numbers to this, okay? So if you have a typical solar mass rotating black hole, that's about the amount of uh, energy that you could extract by processes of this sort. Now, when I see a picture like that in everyday uh, units, so SI units, 10 to 46 joules, my mind just goes blank. Okay? And um, I, I wouldn't know what to compare that figure with. One comparison would be uh, the sun lifetime energy output. Okay? So the sun operates on nuclear reactions, and you can calculate how much energy will the sun put uh, out over whole, whole its lifetime. And it's somewhere like 10 to 44 joules. So a typical sun-like, sun-mass, sun-angular, uh, well, sun-like uh, black hole, it has more rotational energy than the nuclear processes in the sun emit over the whole, whole lifetime of the sun. So there's lots of energy. And the theory allows you to mine that energy. There's some energy exchange that's going on. And although here the thing is classical, this got people thinking uh, that uh, maybe there should be some quantum version of this effect too. And that's so. Um, and that is the direction in which I now want to turn seriously. I need to do a technical part for this. I'll show some pictures in a few moments, but there needs to be the <coughs> serious part of this talk, so the technical interlude. So I'd like to put quantum ideas into those black holes, and I need to know four facts about quantum theory to do it. Do we feel up for it? So they, they will all fit on this overhead, okay? But I want to state four facts about quantum theory. Okay, fact number one. What is the quantum world made of? When you take your first quantum mechanics class, you probably do a particle on the inner box. Okay. You do a particle on the real line, then when you get further, you think of an electron orbiting an atom, and so, so it's a particle orbit in a central force. Then you might put some spin and, and some other things. But when you first learn about quantum theory, it's very much a theory of particles, quantum particles. And it's a useful way to start thinking about quantum theory. Okay. Then, when you go further and you start learning about the quantum electromagnetic field, maybe in a quantum optics setting or maybe in a quantum field theory class, then you start to appreciate that the story isn't quite like that. Quantum theory is not a theory of particles. Quantum theory is a theory of fields, quantum fields that permeate all space and time. Say, so in this room right now, there is the vacuum of the quantum electromagnetic field that fills the whole room. Uh, well, it's not quite the vacuum. There are some, there's some light. There are some light particles, if you want to think of light as particles. And it's often useful to think of the light as particles. But basically, you've got a vacuum that's spread all, over all space and time, sometimes excitations on that uh, vacuum. It's useful to think of them as photons or particles, but it's not really fundamentally particles. It's fundamentally fields that are spread over all space and time. So that's the first fact about quantum world that we need here. The second fact is that um, fact number one is not just empty talk. Uh, it's not just empty description, some verbal description of terms that you uh, have appearing in a calculation. It's something that can be experimentally measured, something that has been uh, experimentally measured. So the quantum vacuum that is spread over all space and time, it has tension and it's something you can measure in the laboratory. And I'd like to illustrate that with the help of um, this uh, mechanical device here. Okay, it's slinky. 
So it's, it's, um, it's an off-the-shelf uh, slinky. I got this from a standard toy store. But I'd like you to uh, imagine that this slinky is the quantum electromagnetic field. Uh, I appreciate the analogy has its limitations, but it, wor it really works much better than you would think. So let's think that this is the quantum electromagnetic field. So we, uh, the way I'm holding it now, not much is happening. This is like the vacuum of the quantum electromagnetic field. It just sits there, but it nevertheless is there, and I can feel that it is there because there's a slight force between my hands, trying to pull my hands together. This is exactly what the quantum electromagnetic field does when you hold it between two, uh, well, not quite hands, but say two, between two conducting plates. If you to put two conducting plates close to each other, there's a vacuum there between those, place, uh, the, those plates. There is a vacuum that pulls those plates together. And that's something that can be measured. It's something that has been measured starting from the 40s. Very good observations started coming up in the late 90s. Um, so the, the place where you first do the theory calculation, as Casimir did it, was between two conducting plates. Uh, that's not how you do the experiment. I mean, it's hard to have two conducting plates that would be very close to each other in a controllable way. The way you usually do the experiment is that you have one conducting plate that's horizontal, then you've got a large sphere, and then you slowly lower the sphere towards the plate, and so that gives you a much more controllable environment. But you can measure that there is a small attractive force between the plate and this uh, conducting sphere. And it comes from the, quantum from the vacuum of the quantum electromagnetic field. There are no particles there, it's just the vacuum still, but the vacuum knows that there are these boundaries for your space-time. The vacuum has tension, it has, this tension has been measured, it's a genuine effect, and it's not a particle. It's real experimental evidence that quantum theory is a theory of fields. And that's the second uh, lesson, the second piece of back, uh, information that we need. Uh, third lesson. Okay, so what's a particle? Particle, well, it's, an, it's an excitation on the vacuum, so in this room there are ceiling lights here, and they send photons. They are excitations on the vacuum. So if I try to push my analogy over here, so if, so if there's the vacuum, I can put an excitation over there. Okay, That's like a photon. Uh, I can even do a polarized photon that way, and a polarized photon that way. The analogy really works more, more, better than you, you'd think. So, particles, they are excitations on the vacuum, and then with them you can start talking about the sense in which they are localized and how accurately and so on. Okay, and the last lesson is, well, how did I put these excitations on the vacuum? I did not bring with me a bag of excitations in, in which I would put one here on the slinky. You saw what I did. I did this. I moved the boundary. And the same thing can be done with the electromagnetic field. So uh, if you imagine that you have some sort of boundary conditions like conducting plates, if you wave those plates, that puts photons in your field. That creates these excitations, these particles. Uh, disclaimer, this isn't how we usually create photons. The, the ceiling lights in this room certainly don't create photons that way. They operate quite differently. But it's been understood since the 70s that this is how you can create photons. It's difficult to do it in practice, and uh, with strictly mechanical motion, we haven't even been able to do it at all. But uh, about 10 years ago, there were some experiments that showed if you simulate mechanical motion by electrical uh, boundary condition on a table 
uh, tabletop uh, waveguide, then there you can, cre uh, then you can uh, experimentally verify this phenomenon that if you change a boundary condition, you create a particle. So what those did was they did basically a, 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 a waveguide version of this. They changed the boundary condition at one end, and that created new, partic <coughs> new particles. And that, that was a genuine measurement. We talk about the dynamical Casimir effect. Or, or, right, so uh, you can create particles by moving boundary conditions. And these were the four pieces of background that we need to appreciate why black holes uh, might be interesting quantum objects. Shall we? Okay, so we are now in the 1970s. So uh, it's difficult to create particles by moving boundary, but it's possible. So what's the most uh, drastic place in cosmology in, in the sky where you can think of moving space-time or dynamically evolving space-time? Well, it's, it's of course this is a star collapse that Oppenheimer worked on. The space-time is highly dynamical there, right? And so you can certainly expect that when you uh, that during that star collapse or any fields that live on your space-time, say the electromagnetic field, there are some quantum excitations that get created there, and it's a messy process. Okay. And then you can ask what happens after the star has collapsed. The black hole settles down to a stationary state. What happens to all of those uh, particles, as it were, that you've created? The conventional wisdom was that all those excitations, well, there are some at intermediate times that they should die away. Um, and that is, brings us to the mid-1970s and to a face and name that you recognize. Hawking did this calculation, and the outcome was, as I am sure you have heard, that after the star has collapsed, the black hole, it continues to radiate these quantum excitations. Okay? And this is the celebrated Hawking radiation prediction. Um, I should mention that, uh, so uh, this is called Hawking radiation for the deserved reason that Hawking got there first. He wasn't the only person working on it. There were groups of people working on similar ideas. There was Leonard Parker and his group in Milwaukee, uh, one of those places where I was a postdoc several years later, working on similar, similar ideas. There were people at King's College London. So, so, so the, these ideas were very much in the air. If Hawking had been run over by a lorry in, say, 1973, just after having written his, test, his uh, textbook, we would have known about Hawking radiation by the late 70s. Not by that name, but um, it, it was there. It was, an, it was a sort of... Um, the input is quite uncontroversial. Once the idea is there, it takes some guy who is a bit faster than everyone else to do the calculation, and Hawking was that guy. So the prediction was, of his calculation, that the black hole, once it's formed, it continues to radiate, and it continues to radiate in a particular way. We call it thermal, that is the characteristic of a thermal uh, uh, spectrum and there's technical terms that you could put to that, but it means that there's a Hawking temperature, okay? And it's a prediction from 1974 numbers. If you put in the numbers, for a solar mass black hole, the temperature is 10 to minus 7 kelvins. You don't expect to see that, even if you find a solar mass black hole. I mean, so, uh, utterly unobservable for astrophysical solar-sized things. But the theory says this should be there. So, um, you could then start talking about what the ultimate origin of this uh, quantum radiation is. You could start thinking about uh, quantum space-time structure. But that would be a topic for a different colloquium. I want to push the angle that uh, if you can't uh, observe this directly in the cosmological setting, 
could you observe it in a different setting in the laboratory? If experiments are not Im imminent in the sky, could you repeat those observations in the laboratory? And that brings me to the last part of, uh, of uh, today's talk. So what would you hope to measure, and, and why would you hope to measure this? So uh, Hawking did this uh, prediction. It's uncontroversial in its input, its standard textbook quantum field theory, pushed to its limits but its standard textbook quantum field theory. But if you follow it, uh, you notice that at intermediate steps, uh, Hawking's uh, derivation, Hawking's calculation, assumes that the usual quantum physics holds even at really high energies, uh, so high energies that we don't have experimental confirmation of whether quantum field theory really is valid there. And you could reasonably ask how robust is Hawking's prediction, and that's one motivation to test this prediction in laboratory systems in which field obey similar equations. And that, so personally, that is my motivation to be uh, interested in simulating Hawking effect and related phenomena in the laboratory. And I'll show here uh, pictures of two experiments that uh, are sort of well known now and uh, fr from, from the past 10 years or so. So what can you do? You can do two things in water surface waves, so this uh, experiment is about 10 years old. And what uh, they did was, so this is a laboratory system, so it's, it's about two meters that way, and you have a water flow going there, and in that water flow you've got a shallow place. There are places where the uh, water is shallower than elsewhere. There's a side profile picture of this bump you've put in the bottom of, uh, of your tank, and the water flows here from left to right like that. And so there's a place, a shallow place, where the water flows fast, and you arrange the water flow there to be faster than surface wave velocity. And that means you can send waves downhill, that's okay, but you can't send waves uphill. They, if you try to send a wave uphill, they get stuck around there. They never make it past that point because the, the water flow velocity is higher than, than the wave velocity. You've created a horizon in the lab. Yeah, if you're thinking of it from this side, it's a black hole horizon. You send a wave that way, it can never go back. If you think of it from that way, it's a white hole horizon. You try to send a wave uphill, but it never gets there. You've created a horizon. And now with the water waves over there, you can see what the water waves do when you try to send them uphill. They never make it there. You can test the ingredients, the classical ingredients that go into Hawking's prediction. And the experiments say the waves behave exactly the way you'd like them to behave. That part of Hawking's prediction is okay, even when you have some water molecules there at some fundamental level. This is good. It's not quantum, but it's on the way towards quantum. The second piece of uh, classical evidence here, uh, this comes from about five, six years ago, and this was an experiment done at Nottingham, again by Silke van Weinfurtner's team. And this is a snapshot of, well, you can see what it is. It's like a bathtub vortex, right? And that, that's exactly what it is. It's in a water tank in uh, Silke's uh, black hole laboratory in Nottingham. I mean, not, not every physics department has a black hole laboratory. We in Nottingham have one. And there's this water tank there. It's about two meters by four meters. And there's a drain hole in the middle of it. And this is a snapshot of the waterways there. You can see that there's rotation going on. This is a simulation of a rotating black hole. Okay, So you send a wave down. If it's far enough down there, it can't come back anymore. This is a simulation of a rotating black hole. There is a horizon there. There's rotation. What would you hope to test over here? Well, remember the picture from Mr. Thornwheeler? 
There's this energy extraction process that's supposed to happen in rotating black holes. Here's a laboratory version of a rotating black hole. Let's go and test the energy extraction thing over here. And you can do that. Uh, now, we don't have a space shuttle that we could send down there and open the cargo bay doors. But what you can do is you can send waves, and you can see what fraction of that waves comes back and what fraction goes down and how it, it depends on the, uh, on the wavelength and so on. And here's a snapshot of those measurements. So there's the drain hole. There's the drain hole. There are these waves coming from the left, and you can see they come with different wavelengths. And you can see what's happened to them. Some of the wave goes down, some of it comes up, uh, some of it comes up. And the part that comes up, it comes with a bigger amplitude than the wave that went down. There's enhancement of the wave in a certain technical sense. There's energy extraction from that rotating black hole. Technically, this phenomenon is known as superradiance, okay? And it came about in this black hole context in the late 60s, early 70s. And this five, six years ago, this is the first um, experimental verification of superradiance in any, any uh, the physical system. Okay? The prediction originally was in black hole context. It happens in water waves, and this is the first prediction in any... Uh, uh, first, uh, experimental, uh, experimental verification of superradiance in any system. So you can do these classical things that are under the Hawking prediction. You'd really like to test the Hawking prediction itself. And now I'm essentially out of time here, so I'll be brief. In fact, I'll be this brief. There is experimental work in truly quantum systems, like light pulses in silica. You send them through. There are nonlinear optics phenomena that, uh, that mimic what happens in Hawking radiation. Uh, you can do things in ultra-cold matter systems. So we talk about Bose-Einstein condensate, very cold atoms where you can slow down speed of, uh, uh, speed of waves. And there is a set of experiments since uh, 2016 by Steinhauer in uh, Israel. And uh, so both of these experiments have seen things uh, it's messy systems, so it's difficult to tell whether they've really seen the Hawking effect there or whether it's somehow a combination of Hawking effect and something else, and if so, what's the dominant thing? But especially with the Steinhauer experiments, the evidence is really getting quite uh, convincing. So these quantum experiments, they are, uh, there have been some, there are some ongoing, and now I'm really out of time, so I'll just mention that in Nottingham we are interested in thermality of acceleration, a prediction related to uh, Hawking uh, radiation and testing that in condensed matter systems. Then both in uh, Nottingham and at other places, including Heidelberg, there is, a, there is work on uh, testing early universe phase transitions. Uh, Okay, and I'm out of time, so let me not elaborate, but let me just mention that these are not just individual labs somewhere doing things. These things require international collaboration. And, uh, I'm part of this particular collaboration that I'm highlighting here. And that is where I should be ending. So why are we testing, uh, trying to test black holes in the laboratory? The mantra is, same equations have same solutions. If you have equations that describe things around black holes, but you can't test them in black holes, you find a laboratory system that has the same equations, and then you test your phenomenon in your laboratory systems. If same equations have same solutions, then it is of interest to do the test in a setting that you can do in the laboratory. Okay. And this has been done both for classical and, and uh, some quantum properties of black holes. Some results are out, and this is an ongoing field of research. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop here. So thank you very much, Jorma, for a very nice talk. So we've got time for questions.
very naive question. So the problem of Hawking, you said, is the problem of energy. That his statement uh, didn't take into account that energy can be big. Now, this system, the energy is probably higher than that, what Hawking thought, but not extremely high. I'm thinking, what about an accelerator of particles? What about a particle accelerator, LHC or oh, so? Can right. we have some effect of this in this kind of uh, lab systems? So, um, okay, so I mentioned, right, so uh, I mentioned here this thermality of acceleration. So there's a prediction related to the Hawking prediction that says if you are in empty space, Minkowski vacuum if it, in technical terms, if you are in a no particle state, but you are not sitting, sitting stationary, instead you are accelerating through it using your rocket engines, then you should feel the Minkowski no particle, no particle state as a thermal bath proportional to your acceleration. And the mathematics of that prediction is very similar to, the, uh, uh, to, to Hawking's prediction. Now, uh, acceleration is acceleration, and in particular, if you are in a circular uh, particle acceleration, those, those, uh, those, say, electrons or whatever you are accelerating, they are feeling acceleration. And there are proposals to test this thermality of acceleration in, uh, in, in particle acceleration, of, uh, in, in these, how do you call them, circular accelerators. Uh, it's um, okay, so it, it gets kind of technical, but it's, it's not easy to do it there. But there is a certain phenomenon there that is related to this, this uh, Hawking radiation. I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, so uh, I should say that this idea of testing the uh, thermal acceleration by uh, uh, the thermality of uh, acceleration in a beam, this idea came from CERN and the... Ali, Alice experiment, perhaps? Uh, um, so this was in the early 80s. I see. Okay, and the person who made this proposal was John Bell, better known for Bell inequalities. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it had to do with spin, polar, spin depolarization of the particle beams. Okay. But it has, it has not been done. Okay. The, the spin, polariza spin depolarization itself is a well-known phenomenon, but relating that to this thermal uh, acceleration, there's sort of a theory gap between doing that. Understand. So thank you very much for, for the talk. It's been great. So I'll take home the message that uh, general relativity saves lives. I'll also take home the uh, second uh, message, which is that I need to get a slinky uh, for myself. And uh, my question is related to the, to the end of your talk. I'm, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on how to simulate uh, black holes using Einstein, uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. Right. Uh, so the so the big selling point of a Bose-Einstein condensate is that the speed of light there is low. Okay? It's not three times ten to eight meters per second. It's it's something like meters per second or so on, and that makes the uh, uh, that sort of enhances the the, the particle creation effect. The second thing is that in a Bose-Einstein condensate, you can make the speed of sound dependent on the position of where you are along that Bose-Einstein condensate. And that allows you to create a sort of effective horizon there. Exactly how you do it in a Bose-Einstein condensate, I'm not the right person to ask, but the moral part of the story is, it's somewhat similar to a uh, what's happening here in this water flow. I mean, so the 
speed uh, of the surface waves here, it's dependent on the position. The speed of the surface waves is different here and different here and uh, different here. And you create a version of this system in the Bose-Einstein condensate by uh, so adjusting the density of the atoms as a function of, of space. More detail I would not be able to tell here. But I can if you want, because I did that in the year 2000, so I can tell you. So the way you do that is you can change the density. So you keep the condensate flowing, and then the speed of sound depends on the density. So varying the density, you can change the speed of sound as compared with the velocity of the flow. And so eventually you get a region in which the speed of the flow is lower than the speed of sound, and another region in which the speed of the flow is larger than the speed of sound, and then you create eff effectively a horizon there. And condensates are so clean that in the end you can have a look at at the perturbations individually. So this is what is happening. <coughs> but if you, want to see, if you want to see a black hole, well, a white hole actually, it's very easy to, to do because you, all you have to go is to, to the tap, to a toilet tap, and open it. And you will see that there is a white hole there. So actually, I show this to the embassy students every year. So I can show it to you afterwards. <laughs> so more questions? So thank you very much again for a very nice talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>